This is our June 2023 uh, Hyperledger presentation. Um, so uh, before we get started, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, the Financial Markets Special Interest Group and the Hyperledger Foundation for their ongoing support and, and making this meeting possible. I, I think we have a really good uh, agenda for today. Um, but before we do that, let's go ahead and take care of some uh, uh, what I call house cleaning. As always, please note that this meeting is being recorded and it's under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation. So we ask that everyone abide by the antitrust policy and code of conduct. The antitrust policy states that we avoid discussions of company specific pricing products and projects. We don't make negative remarks about other companies or products. And the code of conduct means that we treat each other with respect. We never discriminate and we communicate constructively. We fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity, and inclusion. And for new participants, since I think we will have quite a few today, we welcome you. And if you'd like, uh, please introduce yourself in the chat. And if you have any questions or any specific areas of interest, let us know in the chat. We want to make this as interactive as possible. Okay, here's our agenda for today. We've already gone through the general introduction and welcome, antitrust and code of conduct. We'll uh, speak really briefly about some of the Hyperledger community information. James will walk us through an update of blockchain in the mortgage industry. And then we'll have Devin Daly, the chief revenue officer from True, who will walk us through True, what they are and their use of AI and blockchain and Q&A. We always cover this slide in each meeting and that's very purposeful. This is to reinforce that we're all on the same blockchain and now AI journey. We may be at different points along that path. Uh, for today's discussion in particular, and we're all still learning about AI, especially with the advent of ChatGPT. Um, today's session is part of a series on AI and blockchain and will focus on education. As I mentioned in the previous slide, we'll continue to dive deeper into this topic as speakers come in and talk about how they're using AI and blockchain, and we discuss actual use cases. Okay, um, I'm just going to go through the next couple slides really quickly. These slides are intended for those people that are new to the group and would like more information. So this pr uh, slide provides a link to some of the different resources that are available through the Linux Foundation, Hyperledger Foundation, and as you can see, second from the bottom, the link to our subgroup wiki. To access that information, you'll need an LFID, and this information will help you get that. And then lastly, here's just some blockchain training. Uh, I've taken this training. This is how I got introduced to the technology and it's extremely helpful. I, I highly recommend it. So with that, I wanna turn it over to James Hendrick, who's gonna walk us through uh, the state of blockchain. <clears throat> Marvin, thank you very much. If we can move on to the next slide. <clears throat> All right, so starting out with uh, Community by NASCOM. So this article provides a high level overview of blockchain and distributed ledger technology, as well as the basics of smart contracts. So, <coughs> excuse me, everybody. You know, like Marvin mentioned, if you are new to this group, this is a great article to start with. Um, if you're not familiar with these concepts, they do give a, a really good quick overview to help get you grounded. The article goes on to discuss how blockchain and smart contracts can improve loan management through speed, security, and cost efficiency, some of the topics we've talked about previously. It also goes into data science and how it can improve loan management by providing lenders with valuable insights into borrowers and their behavior. So this is information such as credit scoring, fraud, risk modeling, customer seg segmentation, all of these can be analyzed and addressed through blockchain. 
Moving on to the next article. So JP Morgan Chase is developing a chat GPT like software. You know, as we all know, Jamie Dimon is not a big fan of crypto, but he is uh, um, very bullish on blockchain technologies and what they can provide the financial industry. So the company has applied for a trademark product called Index GPT this last month. Um, Index GPT is touted to tap cloud computing software using artificial intelligence for analyzing and selecting securities tailored to um, customers' needs. The technology has a range of possibilities within the financial industry. Banks, uh, including Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, have been testing it for internal use. And these include ways to help Go Goldman engineers create code or answer Morgan Stanley financial advisor queries. But JP Morgan may be the first financial institution aiming to release a GPT-like product directly to its customers. So JP Morgan, they've got about three years on the, the trademark in order to get approval. It's uncertain yet exactly how JP Morgan will deploy it, but the article does close discussing how financial advisors have long feared the arrival of technology that's going to be good enough to displace their role in markets. So far, those fears have largely been yet to materialize, and we don't know that we'll be seeing them. The third article we've got on here is from Black Knight. So Black Knight's been evaluating the applications of artificial intelligence to such areas, analytics, AVMs, mass customization, process improvement. The article discusses how AI and ML in the mortgage industry started over a decade ago, really. Um, and Black Knight is currently using an AI-driven point of sale, transforming the customer experience, and delivering a highly personalized assistance when and where customers need it. The automated workflow walks buyers through the next step, provides a self-guided process for the customers. They've also got AI and correspondent lending that's assessing the completeness of the loan packages and settling conditions when information is missing. In underwriting, they've got AI-powered automation that can be used to maximize underwriter efficiency and reduce risk. And in the lead generation space by using predictive analytics to identify opportunities and deliver a highly personalized communication again with the customers. Uh, Marvin, the next slide. And probably the biggest article we have this week, uh, last month, just a couple of weeks ago, MBA Education hosted an event sponsored by Adventus, or Zaventus. Um, Marvin Van Tugen was the moderator. We have a panelist that came together talking about leveraging AI, blockchain, and newer technologies in today's challenging environment. Um, we had Leah Price from Figure, Mark D'Angelo, PB from Finlocker, myself. We started off with an overview of blockchain, AI, and data fabrics and what they are. And the panel went on to discuss challenges or changes in the industry over the last several years towards these technologies and how, you know, CEOs, CTOs, CIOs are all evaluating these technologies and what their opinions have been um, as we see them more integrated into our environment. We also talked about how companies in the mortgage industry are implementing these technologies, as well as at the recent uh, MBA technology conference, AI was a big topic of discussion there. You know, one of the big focuses that groups were looking at was the risk using chat GPT on um, proprietary data, potentially allows us chat GPT to learn from that data, which can then be shared with others. So there's definitely a concern about that. It's really all about how it comes to deployment. Ultimately, the, the conversation was followed up with a discussion on data analytics. Um, it's roughly about a 60-minute webinar. It's available from both the MBA education website as well as our Hyperledger wiki. Um, Marvin, anything else you want to uh, share about that event? Uh, no, uh, other than it was, uh, I think, a, a very interesting uh, panel discussion. It, it was very interactive. Uh, Everyone on that panel was uh, extremely knowledgeable about the different technologies. And, and I think what was most interesting was everyone's ability to talk about some of the challenges and how uh, companies can take a lightweight approach uh, using POCs, 
using small test cases, uh, a way of making some of these new technologies a bit more approachable. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks for sharing that, Marvin. So if you get an opportunity and you've got an hour, you know, a great presentation to attend, we do have a deck that went with that presentation too, that has a ton of information in the appendix as well. So if you guys are uh, in need of that at all, feel free to reach out. Um, Marvin, next slide. And then, you know, last, a monthly reminder, this is our wiki page. Um, do, you know, take a, a look at the link below. We'll drop it into the chat as well. In fact, I think Alma just dropped it in there for us. Um, you know, save it as a favorite. The uh, LFID that you need to set up, there's instructions in the upper right. Again, it's a free service to, to set up. If you're interested in any of our previous presentations over there on the left-hand side, you can see the month over month presentations and there's links there to both the videos as well as the uh the powerpoint deck that went along with it and then over on the right hand side you'll see we continue to update and add our newest articles um if you're looking for additional additional information as i've mentioned we've curated in the last year and a half well over 200 articles on blockchain we've started to add some ai articles in there as well so feel free if you don't find anything on the the wiki site that you're looking for um, um, you know, it'd be a pleasure to have you reach out and we'll share what we've got. Marvin, next slide. Uh, and I'll pass it back over to you. Hey, uh, thank you, James. Uh, great information as usual. Next, uh, I'd like to introduce everyone to Devin Daly. He's the Chief Revenue Officer at True and a board member of the New Jersey MBA. He's an experienced senior executive with a demonstrated history of working in the computer software industry. He's skilled and has significant expertise in banking, enterprise software sales, e-commerce, and entrepreneurship. He was also part of a panel discussion yesterday titled, How AI Brings Trust to Borrower Data. This was a very informative session, and I highly recommend it. We'll see if we can share a link with the rest of the team as well. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to Devin. Hey, thanks, Marvin. And first, let me thank everybody for joining today. Uh, we appreciate it. And uh, want to make, uh, want to start with, uh, you know, the concept, and we're going to talk about artificial intelligence. We're going to talk about blockchain. We're going to talk about the two, how the two can interoperate. And I, I think it's always important to start with, um, the basis of both of those. And the basis of both of those is, is data. And I start there with, I, I start with that one because it's the truth, but at true, that is the core of our mission in helping lenders manufacture automation quality data. Um, you know, what I often say to, uh, and I've said for years, even, you know, I spent the last five years at a, at a large independent mortgage bank, um, where you know we consider robotic process automation. And I said, robotic process automation is a wonderful technology, but we've got to do something about our data because the only thing that RPA is going to do for us is help us make bad decisions faster if we don't have a good basis in data. And so when we think about manufacturing you know, really good data, um, it's about leveraging machine learning to do that. It's about finding documents and direct source data and being able to cross compare it. You know, again, when I was in the mortgage industry, not as a, not as a solution provider, one of the things I was focused on was continuous QC. And I was focused on that because it just seemed that we spent an inordinate amount of time at the end of the process trying to make course corrections. And then we would incur what seemed to me to be all of these unnecessary fees might be increases in dwell time, might be suspense fees, you know, whatever it equated to, it just seemed unnecessary. And then something I had never done before, I had an opportunity to look at post-closing. And my God, did I get an appreciation for the mess that is post-closing. And, you know, I thought I was going to be able to go in and pull reports and categorize and codify all of the various issues across all of the 10 or 12 investors and yeah, I was. Uh, I got an education in four hours and said, "My God, how do you, I have a new appreciation?" Um, and actually, at the same time, I was evaluating replacing our current OCR vendor, and there were a number of reasons for that. Um, 
it, it, and it mostly because you know the the state of the current OCR technology was there's it's not no human in the loop. There are a lot of humans in the loop. There's a lot of humans in the loop, and in order to go from a 68 percent per page classification accuracy to a 90 plus per page classification accuracy. And by the way, automation quality data is 95% plus, right? That's a huge gap. And my assumption when I was a lender was, okay, 24 hours is okay, but 24 hours is okay. And there's a lot of manual intervention. So is it really any better than what I'm doing now? And, and my thesis was, I've got to get above 90, 95%. I've got to have that automation quality data extracted after you got to have great document classification because only then can you extract data and only then can you compare it across the document set, um, which will give you automation quality data. Uh, and, and what I found was, you know, one, that's the basis because on top of that, that's where you layer solutions. That's where you put your income analysis. That's where you put your asset analyzer. That's where you put your post-closing QC, right? That's where you put your audits. But if you're doing all of those functions based on bad data, we're in the same position we're at. And so, you know, fast forward, that's one of the reasons why I landed at True. I was really impressed with, quite frankly, what I said to them was, what you're doing is so great and so far advanced with regard to the rest of the industry and your competitors. Um, but you don't have any solutions on top of it. And a year later, you know, we're launching in our solutions, as you'll see in a moment. So you can go ahead and advance the slide, Marvin. I think the important thing about it is where we began and why we're so good at what we do. Um, our founder and CEO, uh, Ari Gross, is a PhD in computer vision and has been doing this and is so passionate about the pursuit of excellence. You know, when we get to 99.5, where we're at for one of our clients in terms of per page classification accuracy, he's the first one to say, how are we getting to 99.8, <laughs> right? <laughs> there's no resting, uh, there's no resting for us. Uh, and so that's where we began. You know, we began coming out of a research lab that was led by Ari. Um, and as you can see, we have a couple of fairly large clients up there. Um, and we've pursued since then, you know, a real focus on the mortgage industry. And so today we recognize 850 plus document classes and we extract about you know, 8,000 plus data fields, which gives us, you know, when you look toward the other end of the spectrum here, when we talk about solutions, that was the basis. And some of you may have seen this. Uh, I think we presented this as digital mortgage before I was part of the company. What we at the time called our, our, our audit tool, where we can certify across documents that the documents are consistent, and then if there are inconsistencies, we can throw those up to be manually attended to, right? And then we can take those documents, the authoritative source documents, and compare them to data in the loan file. So we can do a really thorough audit. Now, when you think about that for a moment, we were really using that and still using that in the post-close QC world. Our objective in our strategy going forward is to still start there, because I think one of the tenets that we have to begin with is like any technology, especially any new technology, we've got to experiment. We've got to have a proof of concept, as Marvin mentioned. Once we prove it, that's going to help us with what the really difficult part is. And the difficult part is not technology. It's the humans that use it. It's the organizational change. It's the process change. And if you're not comfortable or you question the technology and or you don't have internal champions, stop, right? So begin with a proof of concept and, and, and our recommendation, because it can be so powerful, is start with post-closing QC. Because in post-closing QC, now you can add a layer of intelligence coming out of there, right? On top of all of what I just mentioned in terms of that data uh, analysis and data validation and data audit, we have business rules. So we can ensure that you know, the note rate is the same from the authoritative source to all the other documents. And when it's not, we throw you an exception, right? And we do that via business rules. Why do I mention that? Because when a business rule fails, that begins our quantification of where the issues are in your manufacturing process. So now within a couple of months, I can give you insight you've never had before. And now we can sit with lenders. What we do is say, listen, here are where your defects are. 
right? Here's where we started. Here's the proof of concept. And you've done the manual review and you trust the data. So now let's shift left. Now let's go into the origination process and catch these the way we would, let's treat it like a manufacturing process, right? It is a manufacturing process. Let's shift left and deploy this solution to catch it at the point of entry. Because you know, we all know the 110, 100 rule. It takes a dollar to collect and correct. It takes $10 to correct it and a hundred dollars when you're done. So why spend the hundred dollars? And in the mortgage industry, it's more like 10, 100 and 1,000 dollars, right? So why spend all that money in post-closing QC when we can identify where our defects are and where they're being injected into the process and shift left, right? Solve the solution at the point. And that solves a couple of things. And you can uh, advance the slide. Uh, it, 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 it solves for the organizational change working backwards. Let people become comfortable with the technology and comfortable, let them have assurances that they're catching this in a way and at a speed that humans never could. And we're not here to replace humans, right? That's not what this technology is about. You know, we talked about uh, earlier replacing financial advisors. I don't think we're going to replace financial advisors. I don't think we're going to replace loan officers. But what we are going to do, they're going to be the intelligent operators of AI, right? Leah Price, we talked about Leah earlier. She educated me. I talked for a while on this. And Leah said, oh, yeah, Deb, there's a term for that. It's called prompt engineer. Uh, and those are the people with the domain knowledge that ask the really smart questions to drive the artificial intelligence. And so we're not replacing humans. We're bringing them to their highest and best use based on their knowledge. You know, No longer are we stare and compare folks. No longer are we document classification or data entry people. We're using our higher order skills. Um, so what does the technology do? And at True, how do we specifically do it? So OCR technology has been around for years. Um, at True, we have our own OCR engine, but most importantly, we've deployed machine learning, machine learning to learn documents, but machine learning also to learn from where we still have humans in the loop. You know, as I mentioned before, we, we have a bunch of customers. W when I tested the platform out of the box, it was 96.7% accurate. But what does that mean? It still means that I've got to touch 3.3% of the documents. Now that's vast different than touching 100%. It's an even, you know, and a vast difference from touching, you know, 30% of the documents. That's a 90% reduction, in fact. But how do we do it, right? We don't use OCR technology the way it used to be. We use contextual classification, which means, you know, for 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 a guy, you know, not a guy in computer a PhD in computer vision, that's me. It's I explain it the way, you know, Ari explains it to me. It's the way a human reads the document. We have a large corpus of mortgage related terms. We know what documents, uh, you know, they occur on. And so when we're reading those documents, we can say, this is an income statement. This is a W-2. This is a closing disclosure. This is an LA, right? And we classify accurately and then can extract the data, right? The other thing that we're actually seeking a, a, a patent on right now is, is something we call provable correctness. And the basis of provable correctness is, for one thing, you've got to prove that you're more accurate than a human is doing the same task, and that you can improve over time. Humans tend to you know, reach a ramp of performance. There's a lack of domain knowledge to domain-specific knowledge. When I get that domain-specific knowledge, my performance doesn't improve. With machine learning, uh, with machine learning, my performance can dramatically improve over time, and and dramatic over time can be ninety five percent accuracy to ninety eight percent accuracy, right? Because that's still, when you think about that, that's a sixty percent improvement from you know ninety five to ninety eight. Um, and then we have our machine learning models, and one of the things that you know there are a lot of mortgage lenders out there, and, and we have some as our customers will say, I'm not necessarily you know. I don't really want to contribute what you learned for me to everybody else in the industry. And that's a valid statement. And so what we deploy is we deploy both our global catalog, what we know, and then our local learning catalog, which is what we know about you and what we've learned through you. So you keep your learnings and we, we have our, our, our global learning catalog. And that's the way we assuage those concerns. So let me pause here for a moment. Are, are there any questions about how we do it specifically? And obviously, I can't go into everything, but if not, then let's roll to the next slide.
Um, uh, Devin, I, I do have a question because what you said on provable correctness really stands out to me because I've spoken with a bunch of OCR companies and yeah. every time they come in and make their pitch for one of our clients, they their pitch is give me 10,000 samples, two months of time and $100,000 in fees, and then I'll train my software for your problem. I mean, you know that quote. <laughs> so what you're talking about is, is something different. Um, yes. and, and I, I want to understand that difference. I, and I think you're getting to it when you start to talk about the technology, but I, yeah. I wanted to have that context. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I think what makes the difference is at true, we're focused on the mortgage industry. Yeah. So we, you're not going to incur that cost. We have a global catalog. And our global catalog is probably going to match 90%, if not 95% of your needs, right? You're going to have custom docs we need to recognize. Of course you are. Um, but the vast majority of the docs, you know, we're going to recognize right out of the box. So there's no, uh, no learning opportunity that we need to do. Yeah. Unless you have custom docs. And we do that rapidly. We can actually give our local learning engine to our clients. So there's no professional services engagement, unless you say, which a lot of customers say, hey, I don't really have somebody that does that. And, you know, we're really busy closing loans over here. So can you do that? But we actually enable our clients through the local learning to actually learn the documents themselves. And over time, right, if it's their humans in the loop, right, their folks who are saying, hey, you know, we have a threshold like any other AI engine or a confidence level. If it doesn't meet our confidence level, it goes to a human for review. When that human recategorizes it, we learn from that action. So we, you know, we take that into account next time we make the decision. Okay. That makes sense. Does that answer your question, Marvin? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Got it. All right, let's, let's advance to the next slide. So, I guess we had a little overlay here. So I think we talked about this, you know, already. We, we have a mortgage-specific AI. We are BPO-free, right? But... You know, I want to be really accurate here. I think one of the hallmarks and, 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 and some of our customers and prospects have said to us, one of the things, you know, that's refreshing talking to you, you're not telling us where you're going to recognize everything and you're not going to need to touch anything. That's it's just not true. We're not, we're not there yet with the technology. Uh, we do have customers. We have one MI customer who's 99.5% accurate. And granted, they've been a customer for three years, uh, but we started out about 94% accurate for them, right? And they deal with, you know, they touch a lot of loans. Um, so we do have we do have BPO partners. We don't have our own BPO shop because we don't need it, quite frankly. Um, uh, so 100% BPO free, but 100% BPO free is going to get you about 95% of the way there. You still need people to go in and do the exception processing. Hey, the threshold that you set for this CD was 75%. It came in at 74%. Somebody's got to review it. Yes, it's a CD. So we'll learn from that the next time. We classify our documents. We talked about, we have really robust technology. It's not just OCR. We use machine learning. And, and again, we've invested five years specifically in the mortgage space. One of the sexier things about this is because our classification is so good, our data extraction is of really high quality and a lot. there's a lot of data coming out. One of the challenges that our clients have, and this is a good challenge is, I'm getting so much data from you that I never got before. How can I leverage it? You know, how can I use other forms of AI, predictive analytics, to understand what customers are my ideal customer profile, to maybe help prioritize for my LOs what prequals they should be following up with, right? Um, maybe to look at our servicing, couple this with our servicing data and, and develop models, you know, to understand risk in the portfolio. So the next challenge, I think, for customers when we start to deploy this is, how can I monetize all of this additional data to further improve my operation? You can go to the next slide. And these are just some results. I do want to point out the 300% increase in underwriter, underwriter productivity was specific to MI. Um, 99.5, we've talked about one of our MI clients there. Um, the data captured, you know, 8,500 data elements, really rich sources. The other thing that helps us do those 8,500 data elements is do a really fine-grained audit across the documents and across the documents to the data in the loan file. And we do that really rapidly. Next slide. 
So we talked about, you know, the use cases. We talked about, you know, starting and post-closing QC and then shifting left. Um, we're finding a lot of use cases, obviously, in MI, but also with servicing, loan onboarding, as well as uh, correspondent lenders. You can go uh, to the next slide. And here are the solutions that we're working on, right? So I talked to you, you know, we're going to launch our income analysis engine next month. We've got our post-closing QC solution. Through a partnership with Clear Capital, we'll work on um, uh, our collateral analysis uh, and asset analysis. And then later this year, we're also going to have a fraud detection. I'll say it again, you know, we're really fortunate to have been founded by Ari Gross, who's one of the world leading experts on font detection, right? This is such a specialty, but that is so important in fraud detection, right? Not only how the documents and images line up, but the font and, and the minute differences between the fonts. So we're gonna have a significant advantage when it comes to our fraud detection uh, uh, solution that comes out later this year. Um, what other solutions? The loan verification, the compliance suite, compliance or true quality automation. Uh, and we talked about our audit and QC here. So I think what's on the next slide, Marvin, is, is kind of where we go next. And this may be, you know, what, you know, where we started kind of overall discussion about AI and blockchain, if that makes sense. Now, I, all of this information really ties together well from an OCR um, AI and, and blockchain perspective. Uh, I was actually in an MBA technology forum meeting about three or four months ago where they said that the IRS had actually come to them and they were working on an OCR problem. They were trying to uh, trying to digitize uh, a lot of the tax information that they'd received. And the problem that they were grappling with is their accuracy threshold was about 65, 66%. Uh, and then the people within the MBA were saying that from an industry perspective, it, it, it's more 90, 95%. So what do you think are, are some of the key steps that a company or an entity like the IRS needs to go through in order to get their accuracy from 60, 65% initially to what we're seeing as an industry? Uh, that's, that, that's a great question. And it's, uh, you know, while True has focused on the mortgage industry, um, we do have tax solutions. You know, we have really large tax, practice, tax practices that use our, um, you know, use our technology. So we're familiar with that space. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's about a combination of technologies, right? Um, it, it's tough to start from a generic platform. Uh, where you don't have any industry knowledge. But the IRS is certainly in a great position because they have volumes of data, right, that they can rely on and back test on. Um, I think it's really just about, you know, deploying the right resources. I mean, um, you, you know, years ago, I, I got in, introduced to, I'm, I'm fortunate to live fairly close to Princeton University. And I got introduced to several, and, you know, if you know anything about the applied mathematics field, Princeton University has the best program in the world. And I got introduced to 12 PhDs who were focused on applied mathematics. And these are the guys that solve problems. You know, it's the PhDs in applied mathematics that can solve those problems, you know. And, and by the way, going from 65 to 95% is a mammoth task. Yes. Going from, believe it or not, going from 95 to 98 is an even, it's probably an order of magnitude even lar larger than the, than the 65 to 95. So um, they're probably going down the wrong, going down the, the right track, I should say, forgive me, if anyone from the IRS is listening. Uh, um, it, it's, it's a big problem and it's going to be time consuming. And, and I think it's, you know, it's about bringing in people with domain knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, the right domain knowledge to get that done. It, it, it is a mammoth task. And, uh, you know, perhaps uh, you, you can refer me to those folks after Marvin. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can dig up their information. One of the limitations that they were facing is yeah. that they could not use any type of BPO services because yeah. yeah. uh, what the people in the group thought was, okay, if you're trying to go from 60 to 65 to 290, then you will need not necessarily an army, but people to actually support that step. Um, but that's not something that I think the IRS as a government agency can can utilize. So I, I think that was one of the problems they were grappling. Yeah. And, and you know what? Here's what I'll tell you about that. Um, we face that problem and we face that problem currently uh, as we think about expansion. Uh, and I'll just say maybe expansion a little bit north. There are laws stricter than those in the U.S. with regard to uh, uh, privacy information and data can't be moved outside of the country. Uh, so what True has developed, because we have this large corpus of knowledge about words and phrases used on U.S. residential mortgage documents, we've started this automatic redaction process. So potentially you could use a BPO process if it's 100% automatically redacted. And then you have to determine, right, if it can't be 100% automatically redacted, what's the nature of the information that I'm giving out and is it coupled on this document or across documents? with any others. So I think that's a, that's a problem that can be solved pretty readily. I think we'll have that solved in the next three months. Oh, that's great. That, that, that's a very encouraging to, to hear. And, and you mentioned um, using word recognition um, yes. because go, going back to the MBA webinar, um, one of the things that we'd mentioned with the MBA audience is from a chat GPT perspective, it's built on, I think, 100, 176 billion tokens. So those are letter combination word pairs. So in the word recognition approach that True has, how does that compare in contrast to the token approach that ChatGPT uses? Are, yeah. are they compatible or... It, it, do I it, misunderstand the whole process? No, you, you don't misunderstand it at all. You, you, as a matter of fact, you've nailed it. And, and those tokens can be applied and associated with multiple documents. And then it's about the relative use that that one token compared with the other token to make, you know, the likelihood that this is an income statement versus a pay stub, right? Um, uh, you know, the choice. And, and so it, it, you're hundred percent right in, in, in drawing an analogy to it. It's just that the, you know, the body of knowledge, the language model is a lot smaller for us. And quite frankly, that's why we, we just did a test against Google and AWS with regard to um, uh, pay stubs and W2s and uh, our, our results were stellar. And it's because of that contextual classification. Okay, great. Um, are there any questions questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I, I have a ton of questions since I'm really excited about this topic and, and I saw the presentation that you guys did yesterday, but I, I don't want to monopolize uh, this discussion since we do have Devin here. So um, if, if there's anyone else that has any questions, uh, I mean, please feel free to type it into the chat or, or just to log into the discussion. Okay. Um, if there aren't any other questions from the rest of the team, I, I did want to get your thoughts, Devin, on um, how blockchain ties into AI and what you guys are doing around True. I, I, when I was speaking with Ari at the MBA tech conference, he says that blockchain can be a basis for that common understanding of all of this mortgage information. If you start with, and this is going to be a gross oversimplification, if you start off with correct data and a common understanding, and that forms the basis of the blockchain, and then apply AI to that, you have a robust technical solution. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I'll say it a little bit differently and I'll, and I'll, I'll draw a direct analogy to, to what my objective when I was still, you know, on the lending side of this was, you know, I, I talked about continuous QC. Um, when you think about continuous QC, right, if, if I can take my continuous QC efforts and somehow guarantee and certify the actions that I've taken, right, uh, and create a fast way to audit it, 
aren't my loans, you know, I used to say, you know, maybe flippantly, aren't my loans worth more, you know, on the, uh, uh, on, on, the on the secondary market, right? And and so you begin to ask that question and you say, well, how, how really could I engineer that? And I think I think the answer is in, in, in Ari's answer. And the way I thought about it was, and the way I think about blockchain, you know, I've heard a lot of, and, and you and I talked about this, Marvin, I've heard a lot of people say, I'm going to build an application on top of blockchain. And, and, and to me, that's the antithesis of blockchain, right? You don't want to build an app, keep, keep your, keep your applications built on the proper technology. And, and for, for me, the continuous QC and that rapid audit capability was the ideal use of blockchain. But here's what I mean by that. We do intake of documents. We do intake of direct source data, right? Maybe I'm using form free. Maybe I'm using plaid I'm get, or I'm getting income data from, from a document. We do a fraud check on that document. Fraud check's fine, right? We hash that document. We take that hash and we store it in our system of record, but we also put it on the blockchain. Step one, we extract data from that document. We take that data, we put a hash on it. We store it in both places and we create a link between the document and the data. We make a decision and run a calculation. We do the same thing, that same process, step three, create hashes, store them separately. And now what we've created is this auditable trail, right? And we make a decision based on those calculations, do the same thing. And so at the end of the process, what we have is really a completely auditable and certifiable process that says, I got this document or this data from this place at this time. The borrower uploaded it at the portal. A borrower, you know, signed into form free and, and got the data. This, however, we obtain the data, we certify that process, we store it. We extract data from it. Maybe it's just an XML file or a JSON file, or we've extracted it from a document. We run calculations on it. And that whole process is certified. And that way, when you think about it, you know, you, you think about eliminating costs in the back end of the process. And there are a lot of costs there. There's a QC cost, whether your, your QC is internal or your QC is external. Um, when you begin to you know, use TPR firms, there can be a significant cost there. And so is there a way to say to the TPR firm, I've done a lot of the work for you, or this third party has done a lot of the work for you? Is there a way to lower that overall cost? Not only lower the overall cost, but make this a lot faster, right? So at the end of the day, the TPR firm is lowering their labor cost. The lender has you know, certified this loan and perhaps can get you know, to cash flow a lot quicker and start producing a lot higher quality loans that are potentially worth more on the secondary market. And if not, they're worth more, I'm certainly getting, I'm certainly speeding up my cash flow. And so that's the way I think about, you know, and obviously that's the interplay of AI and blockchain because we're yeah. using AI and machine learning to do all of that data certification and data audit. Does that make sense? Oh, a absolutely. A and Devin, the way you just described the, the interaction of blockchain and AI, the use of hash, um, the how to expedite processing. And I can't help but think that you must have been sitting in on our design discussions when we were building out our blockchain POC, because you pretty much uh, articulated the problems we faced and then the approach we decided to take. So I, I think that's what a lot of people, at, at least those working within the blockchain industry are, are realizing that that's the best way to utilize blockchain is to minimize that processing cost, use that technology uh, in a more efficient fashion. So yeah, that, that was great. Yeah. It, great architecture. It was, uh, you know, the reasoning behind that, it was, you know, I used to say you go to, uh, you, you know, you go out to Silicon Valley and you make a pitch and this is 10 years ago, you just use the word disintermediation, just one yeah. slide, one deck, and it'll give you a check for $10 million. You know, three years ago, it was, hey, I'm building something on blockchain and here's a check for $10 million. So yeah, yeah. I think it, people were just driven a lot by that, even though it was probably the wrong decision. Yeah, and now we're trying to use that same type of uh, approach with AI. I, I've been pitching AI. I haven't gotten the check for five or 10 million yet, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know how that goes. All right. Yeah, let's jump over. I have one question. No, don't laugh at this, but I've always wondered about this. I, I joined, sorry, half hour late. Um, but um, looking at this today and, and sticking to mortgages, why can't I get a mortgage today in two minutes and close in three minutes? Uh, well, let's what's start. What stops us considering considering I have a 
I do have a credit score like most people do. Um, so I don't today understand why I can't get a mortgage. Not that I'm in that market, but why couldn't I get a mortgage in two minutes and then bring in a new technology like AI, um, chat T GPT with all its flaws that I've been looking at. Um, is that the expectation in the future? I mean, what is it vested interest around that closing cost of five, seven thousand dollars or what prevents that from happening? Because I can get a car loan that fast, but I can't get a mortgage. Yeah, and yeah. Mortgage has got a backed asset. The car doesn't want to drive it, it off a exactly lot. Exactly right. And, and a car's mobile, right? I can, right. I, I, I can smash it in five minutes. So yeah. why is what prevents that from happening today? First off, I, I, I don't think the objective is wrong. I think, you know, the two minutes or even two days is going to be, you know, quite some time before we get there. Um, there are still parts of the mortgage industry, and I know you're going to find this surprising, that are pretty archaic. You know, we've yeah, got Mar hundred counties. Uh, oh, sorry, Marvin sent me a document on that that I read through, and I saw some of that on there about the paper. <laughs> just yeah. interest, but I was just wondering, uh, sorry for interrupting, but yeah. No, no worries. I was just going to say, we've got 3,400 counties. The, the first challenge would be to digitize all of them. You know, and even right. I, I think the top 500 counties are responsible for 93% of the mortgage transactions. So maybe let's just start with 500. Uh, but a lot of it's around title. And I think, you know, the appraisal process, I know the GSEs are really laser focused on on, on the appraisal process mm -hmm. and appraisal automation and and firms like Clear Capital that I mentioned before, um, you know, that we're going to partner with are, are focused on expediting that as well. Right. I think we've got several years, but I think we've got, you know, and everybody uses that that that, that analogy about, you know, getting the car loan. Right. Uh, yeah. Is legal, uh, the legal system locked into this also, too, because obviously the, you have attorneys involved in a lot of this stuff in closing costs, whether it's commercial or residential. Are they, do they somehow under, do you have any evidence that they are sticking a wrench into this? Um I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but there's a lot of people with their fingers, you know, that drive the cost up under the mm -hmm. aegis of let's protect the consumer. Um, so there are a lot of people that uh, in the middle of all of these transactions, particularly at the back end and, and uh, you know, not, not just particularly at the back end, but during, you know, during the process as well. Right. Interesting. And, and Jeff, if I could, take a stab at answering that question. And I'm going to go back to part of the discussion um, that you guys had, uh, Devin, yesterday, yeah. that a significant portion of the origination cost is due to compensating the salespeople. So my personal theory, and I'm probably going to get into a lot of trouble with this, is a lot of what's preventing a two minute or even more realistically a 45 minute uh, loan closing process is the social inertia that's yeah. built into the current system. If yeah. I'm a mortgage broker and I'm getting, and I'm going to just make up a number, $1,000 per loan, it's in my best interest to make sure that I'm a part of that process and continue to work with you for better or for worse to get that loan to where I want it to go, as opposed to something that's completely automated. And, and let me give you an example. About 10 years ago, I was working on an online loan application for a bank that I can't mention the bank, but it was for high net worth individuals to get loans uh, unsecured loans. If you have a credit score of 820, you're going to pay back your loan. Okay. If you're a high net worth individual, I, as your banker, am incentivized to give you a loan for up to $20,000 to buy a racehorse, to buy a car, to buy whatever, because at a credit score of 820, you're going to pay back that loan, period. So we built that application and that was up and running and still is up and running. But the problems associated with a mortgage are several magnitudes more complex because of the social inertia of the loan brokers, of the different parties that are part of the process, and uh, honestly, a lot of the risk associated with it. And if there's any type of fraud, losing 20000 is significantly less impactful than losing 500 or average cost of a house now, 350,000, 400,000. So 
that's why I think we're still not seeing the two minute loan. Honestly, I don't think we're ever going to see that. I would be happy with the 24 hour loan. And James, anything you want to add or yeah. you're going to shoot me later on? No, no, actually, I would tend to agree with you, Marvin. Uh, you know, getting down to a two minute loan, I think would be fantastic. Um, the reality is I see the process being shortened down to two and three days over the next, you know, several years. Um, but I don't know that until, you know, much like I think Devin brought up until you get all these title companies and others, you know, integrated into a, you know, similar platform or connection methodology. Um, I just, I mm -hmm. don't see that we get to a point where you've got pretty much in instantaneous approval. Interesting. Yeah. I, and one last thing that I want to add in this, we actually build a proof of concept for a loan origination process where we could get through, and this was simplified through the entire loan process within a two hour window using integrations, using APIs. So technically it's feasible. It's not the technology that's yeah. the problem. It's the process and the regulation. And for the amounts that we're talking about, maybe it's a good thing that it's slow. And I, I, I'm really impatient. I, in, I, I'm a TikTok user, anything that's three minutes long, I, I can't pay attention to that. So uh, I need a loan, I need a loan quickly. Um, but I think right now it's still a good thing that it does take at least a week or a couple of days. Yeah, Marvin, you may want to move on. If you do, that's fine. If not, I could add a comment to this. If Oh, no, so, de definitely uh, add a comment. Okay. All right. So Jeff, I'm an old mortgage technology writer. I've been writing about the industry since 97. Mm -hmm. And we sometimes forget that this is a, a risk-based uh, process. Devin, what did you say? You guys are at uh, like 97% accuracy on those docs now? Yes. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that means only 3% of the time you're going to miss. And Marvin's right. The loan is about $350,000. So if you do 100 loans, three of them are going to be bad. Now, when you make a good loan as a lender, you're mm -hmm. going to make what? Two grand? Well, in today's market, the profitability is actually very mm -hmm. close to zero. But on a bad loan, you're going to pay back the entire amount. So on those 3%, you've now lost a million dollars. How many loans do you have to make to make that up? You're not going to make it, right? Yeah. So remember, this is about this is about risk-averse business people trying to make sure they don't lose money. And so it's never going to be a two-minute loan. It might be a two-day loan. It's more likely going to be a week loan. In my so, so in today's paper world, if I can interject, what's the what's the miss rate on? I've heard horror stories even around title um, clearance on a closing when somebody comes back later and says you couldn't do that. How often does that happen? Is oh, that it happens under all the, the time. It happens oh, all the time. Okay. That's what. Yeah, that's why what Devin's talking about today is so exciting because right. in a paper based world, we have errors all through the process, and as Devin pointed out. The longer it takes to solve it, the more expensive it becomes. Mm -hmm. And if you look at J.D. Power's surveys of uh, borrowers, the thing that makes them the angriest is being getting to the closing table thinking it's all done and it's not done. Now, TRID, right. the changes in TRID change that a lot because now you've got to redisclose everything and wait another three days. And that punched a hole in that problem. But it gave borrowers another reason to be upset. The, the, the point of it all is, is we're not lending against cars. We're lending against a very right. expensive, very massive asset. And the, it's not the lender's money that they're giving away, right? It's somebody else's money. And it's a complex system that's never going to be like a car loan. But with software like what we've heard about today from Devin and with other blockchain applications, it'll get a lot better than it is today. Right, right. Thanks, Rick. Like that, that, that was I, great commentary. I'm uh, like that, you, Marvin, and Devin. I, I'm so impatient on technology. I frustrate people every time I go into a store. Like, why do you have to do this? Why do you have to do this? How come you can't do this? I don't understand this. The younger people, and they're looking at me like, it's this old guy doing, complaining about, you know, you know what a blockchain is, folks? I went into my Verizon, uh, not to give them a plug, but a new phone in Verizon about a year ago, and I was just in the office, and I was just, they're just setting the phone up. They're like, why can't I pay through crypto? I don't get it. Yeah, but you must, if you're a tech company, why don't you have a blockchain? Does Verizon have a blockchain? What's a blockchain? And they're just, what's, what's you people? You want to, I going to give you a credit card? What's going on with you? <laughs> they're like, get him, get him out of here. <laughs> and Jeff, we need to get you out in front of everybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> you're a great just, advocate uh, for technology. Uh, yeah, may I, I, 
May I add something else? Because Rick was saying that it's a, a, um, a risk averse uh, industry. I also would say it's a lazy industry <laughs> in the sense that um, usually they, unless the, um, unless Fanny or Freddie push or, set, or bring up, bring out something that says that they should do this, they tend to just keep on doing things the same way. Um, and they're, they're not so prone to innovate. Um, so only if they're forced to move, because in, in, during the, uh, the pandemic, during COVID, they were, they had to update how they were closing. Yeah. They could have done that way before because the technology existed way before, but they never did it. They didn't do it until they were forced to, because people couldn't go to sign. So if they couldn't go to sign, they couldn't close business. Um, and, 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 and only then did they implement that part and now they're working with it, but they would never have done it before um, because no one was forcing them to do it. Um, I think that there's also a bit of that in, in the mix, right? Um, that it's an industry, it's not the regulations, I think it's um, it's it, it, they use that sometimes they use that as an excuse. Um, I, I I think they don't they 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 have an aversion to innovate. Also, I uh, this is going to be a, maybe a first for me. I'm, I'm usually not very sensitive, Maria. Um, I I think we're of like minds of this. I'd probably use a different word or a different phrase. I'd say that the mortgage industry is filled with fast followers, not necessarily. And, and, and uh, I can't I can't take credit. It was a former boss of mine who said described his firm as, as, as a fast follower. And I think the mortgage industry, by and large, with the exception of a few, are fast followers. And because they are risk averse, they really don't want to do anything that Fannie and Freddie or uh, all the GSAs haven't approved as of yet, right? It's it's very risky to do that. I don't know. I like Maria's the lazy term. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to be nice. <laughs> I <know>. First for <laughs> me. Well, I I think those uh, are some great points, and everyone this this was a, a great discussion. I think those of us, and I think it's almost all of us that have been in the industry for a while, we we understand that the challenges of working within the mortgage industry. And that's why we're here. Hopefully that we can help change the industry and make some money from it. So uh, I, I wanna get back to you, Devin. Was there anything else you, you wanted to cover on the presentation um, or, okay. Uh, were there any other questions for Devin or from uh, AI or, or True Perspective? Okay, um, I, I want to go ahead and because we just have a couple minutes left, um, I want to talk about what we're going to try and cover in our next um, in our July meeting. And I'm trying to get to the right slide. Excuse me. In our July meeting, we're going to have a, another uh, company come in. And this is going to be, I'm trying to share the screen here. So we're going to have, uh, excuse me, while it's loading, Sanjay Kumar Nishank. He's the Chief Operating Officer from Intain. And Intain provides a blockchain platform using a Hyperledger Fabric that brings the different parties uh, together onto a blockchain, a single blockchain platform. And let me get to a brief description really quickly here. Okay, uh, so Intain is a blockchain enabled structured finance platform that gets lenders, issuers, investors, and other parties like services, trustees, and rating agencies onto a shared data platform for these transactions that uses artificial intelligence and blockchain for a seamless flow of data with zero reconciliation, complete transparency and provenance of asset and data. So you know what that, that's a big claim. Uh, I've spoken with Sanjay a little bit. It sounds like they have a real interesting solution. So hopefully people on this call can join us for that one as we continue to delve further into AI and blockchain. And with that, we're at the top of our hour, but 
Uh, does anyone have any other questions or, or comments before we all sign off? Yeah, Marvin, can we, or, or, or Devin, can we get your slide back? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Devin, and, great presentation today. Thanks for coming and sharing with the group. Thanks for having me, Marvin. We appreciate I appreciate the invite and everybody for, uh, extend that from everyone at True as well. Yeah, that, thank you, Devin. This meeting will be recorded, Jeff, and it, it will be posted onto the Hyperledger Wiki. So all of that information will be there and we'll post his, his uh, excuse me, Devin's presentation there as well. Well, it's, it's actually my wedding anniversary today. So I snuck in here for a half hour while she's out doing her flowers. Okay. <laughs> it's not, I'm not, not joking. <laughs> so I better get back. <laughs> okay. Well, happy anniversary, Jeff. Happy anniversary, Jeff. <laughs> and thanks everyone for attending. I appreciate it. Thank Bye -bye. you, Evan. Thank you, Devin. It was a great presentation. Bye -bye. Yeah, thanks.